<laughs> okay. Children's church, seven years old and under. Get. Get. What was going on? Love here. Last week, uh, of course, last week being New Year's, we talked about New Year's resolutions. We talked, we talked a little bit about what uh, what re New Year's resolutions we we were making or have made in the past, how well we did, how well we didn't do. Uh, and Helen said something very interesting. Helen said, said Helen said that uh, she she talked about something that I've been thinking about for a while. She said that she believed that this year was the year that Jesus would return. And, and I'm not, my sermon is not to criticize that thought, the rap, that the rapture would happen this year. Uh, it just got me thinking. And I thought more and more about it this week, and the question kept coming up in my mind, are we ready? <laughs> that, that was the question that kept coming. Uh, and if we're going to be truly honest with ourselves, with each other, then that's the real question, isn't it? Because uh, the reality is, not to know when he will come back. The question is, are we prepared? Now, I'm not trying to criticize Helen here and what she believes. I think it's great to live our lives that he might return any day. In fact, any minute. So let's look at what the Bible has to say about this. Uh, I was reading, it's, this story is in a couple places in the Bible, but I, I chose Matthew. In Matthew 24, beginning at verse 36, it says, no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, mar marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be coming the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you should also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it. Wow. <laughs> I read that and went, wow, that's kind of interesting. Um, it's very interesting and maybe a little terrifying. In verse 36 it says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Uh, now, I think the second word in, in, in that sentence is very uh, important. It says, now concerning. <laughs> I, I think the word concerning is very important because I think it's something we should be concerned about. We, we can't claim to be a Christian and not think about the second coming. Be because if you believe that, then you think it's over. And this is it. And I, I don't think a lot of people would say this is heaven. Right? So, I, I think it's something to be concerned about. I think the return of Jesus should be on our thoughts and in our minds. Uh, we can see that it's a very specific point in time. The day is decided. The hour is decided. And it should be no surprise that even the second has been decided. I don't think it's going to be well around that time. I think it's going to be a very specific time. The time is not decided by anyone other than God. The angels don't know when. Not even the Son of Man knows. Uh, now, if the Son of God doesn't know, then it's a pretty well-kept secret, right? I must believe that, it, and, and this is just the way my head works, but I have to believe it was the same thing for the first coming of Christ. Uh, we just celebrated Christmas. And I don't think that kind of happened, oh well, around that time I think it was a very specific time. It was a very specific date. And I think it was very specific second 
that had happened, and only God knew what it was going to. And I, and I, one of the things that I always think about when I think about Christmas is when God announced to heaven that it was going to happen. When He called the angels together and said, "Oh, by the way, you go tell Mary." That's her. It's time. I mean, I think there was an amazing party. <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to be the same thing in the second coming. I just don't know how joyful it will be. I'll, I'll get to that. Also note that not even Jesus, who is all-powerful in this situation, even though he's all-powerful, he is completely at the will of God the Father. He doesn't know. It's a need to know thing. I, I guess God will just say today's the day. Go. Um, and then you can read the same verse. When you read the Gospels, there's there's uh, synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels. And what that means is they are telling the same story following pretty much the same timeline. And there's a lot of things that intertwine. John is not one of the synoptic Gospels. John just starts at the ministry of Jesus. And it just talks about the ministry. So they're a little bit different. But sometimes in the synoptic Gospels, words line up perfectly almost. And so let me read the verse again in uh, Matthew. It says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but only the Father. Then we read it in Mark. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. Pretty close, right? I, I think He wants us to hear this. I think God wants us to understand that you don't know when it's going to happen. The angels in heaven don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus Himself doesn't know what's going to happen, but God does. And then He says in verse 37 and 8, For... Uh, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Now, maybe you don't see the comparison between the story of Noah and the return of Christ, but let's really take a look at it. Noah was warning them, right? Noah was giving them all kinds of warning. Uh, yet life kept going on as though nothing was happening. And even if the Bible doesn't say that Noah was uh, witnessing to them verbally, I mean, the question had to be, Noah, why are you building a boat? <laughs> I measured it out one time, a long time ago, for a sermon. And the ark was from the stop sign at the corner of the Wilson, and it went down to the curve. It was from this wall... To the, out, the inside of the first wall of the uh, stone wall of the parking lot, wide. And the deck was at the right at the lip of this roof. That's how big it was. Okay? So someone had to be saying, hey Noah, why are you building a boat? <laughs> why are you building it nowhere near water? Why is it so big? There had to be some questions. So I can't help but think that Noah said, well, God told me it's all going to start circling the drain pretty soon. There's a flood coming. And God's fed up. Noah was building, preparing. Yet life for everyone else rolled along as normal. Noah was concerned about tomorrow. And the world was not. Can you see that in our world? We, we, we want to live. The world will tell you live for today. <coughs> Whine and complain and moan about yesterday. Live for today. Try and pay those bills tomorrow. That's, that's, that's the world we live in, right? Um... The world, in Noah's time, was not concerned about tomorrow. People were partying, getting, getting married, until it started to rain. For the first time ever. You realize that? It never rained before that day. If you read 
Genesis, it says that the world was watered from underneath. There was no rain. Imagine the first time it was a drop. Is that a goose? Because <laughs> we live where we live. <laughs> There's another one. Oh no. The sky is leaking. What's happening? And then it says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited on the days of Noah. This is from 1 Peter. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. That's how 1 Peter describes what was going on. Basically saying what I just said. Of all the world, eight people were concerned about tomorrow. Of all the world, eight people actually listened to God. I mean, there had to be some questions. Think about it. You're laying, okay, they didn't have windows, like they didn't have glass in their windows, so you're laying in your bedroom. In the middle of nowhere in this little town, and all of a sudden a giraffe walks by the second story window. <laughs> and you've never seen one before. And oh, there's another one. And you look out on the street, what is that idiot Noah doing now? There had to be questions. When everything's showing up in pairs. They knew nothing because they didn't want to know anything. Right? You can't help anybody that doesn't want to be helped. You can't teach anybody that doesn't want to learn. Noah must have told them. Noah was building this boat on dry land, nowhere near a body of water. Do you, look, do you really think people outside the walls of this church want to hear about the return of Jesus? Do you really think that? For a second? Do you think they want to hear about how it's going to be? Let me read to you how it's going to be. And I'm going to read to you from uh, Matthew. Okay, we're going to stay in the same. It says, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the heavens and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's Matthew 24. Just a little bit earlier in our chapter. Do you really think the world wants to talk about that? I mean, how many of us want to think about that when we begin to think about our unsaved loved ones? I remember there being a song out there that said, Oh, Jesus, come, just not yet. And, 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 and there's another song out there, and I can't remember how it goes, but it basically says, God's grace is what keeps him from doing it. Then he goes on in verse 40, 41. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at a mill, one will be taken and one was left. Uh, the, the mill thing, it's a hand mill, it's a stone mill, where women sat down, one on each side, and they turned the wheel to grind the grain. So it says one will be taken and one will not. God will decide who goes. <laughs> and God will decide who doesn't. Does that scare you? It scares me. There's things that scare me now that never scared me before. I remember when The Exorcist came out. Remember that movie, The Exorcist, when it came out? People were terrified. I remember my aunt went and saw it. She didn't sleep for a week. I was a young teenager. I went and saw this movie, sat there and laughed. I watched it about two years ago. I sat there terrified. Because I don't care about the graphics and everything. I just think of the reality of what can happen. So things scare me now that didn't scare me before. But when I think about one going and one being left, 
I'm always afraid of that, especially when I wake up and bed and Brenda's not there. So. <laughs> In Mark 13 it says, And then he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and for the, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. I can't help but believe that if he's gathering his elect, then they must be going to him, right? Every funeral that I preach, I always start off with this verse, and it's not because it's the only one I can choose from. It's just, it's so strongly grounded in what I believe. Uh, in, in John 14. And, and one of the reasons that I so strongly believe in this is when I was taking my ministerial courses through Nazarene Bible College, they made me do an exegete. An exegete, exegesis is to do a deep, deep study on a little bit of scripture. And I mean deep study. Like take every word, take it apart, look at it in the Hebrew, look at it in the Greek, read the lexicon, find the under meaning, put it in the culture it was in. I mean, you tear it apart. And I had to do it on John 14, the first verse. I had to write 2,500 words on it. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's an, ooh, sorry. That's an exegete. 2,500 words on, on that. And later on, it says this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may also be. Right? So, you believe in God, believe also in me, and my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. Boom. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to be with myself that where I am you may also be. So, when he says he's sending his angels to collect his elect, I can't help but think that this is what he's talking about. And, and, and now I don't know about you, but if this is the way it's going to happen, it's all going to take place. And I'd like to be one of those ones who was taken, right? Not one of the ones who's left. And, and because I do believe there, I, I, God is a God of second and third and fourth and fifth and tenth chances, right? But I just think you're going to go through a lot of problems before you get that next chance. So I want the easy way up. Not really easy, but... I want the first. I want to get on the first boat. So how do we make sure this happens, right? All of this to make sure that we get on the first trip. Matthew twenty four forty two says, "Therefore, stay awake, stay alert." Some translations. That's the title of my sermon. Stay alert. We do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Your Lord, capital L, meaning God. All right, so you see the switch. It talks about the Son of Man, Jesus coming, and then he refers to him as Lord, capital L, which means God, not little or like little Lord Fauntleroy. God. So he says, stay alert, because you don't know what day God's coming back. Wow. Does that scare you? That means God was there. It's the second time around. First time he came like a, a lamb and we nailed him to a cross. Second time he comes, he's coming like a lion. And he'll be doing the nailing. Usually, and it starts off with the word therefore. Usually when we start off with the word therefore, I like to back up, but we don't have to. We just did it. Jesus will return and there will be no warning. And when he returns, he will gather up his elect to be with him in heaven, and those who remain will suffer. Let's go back to the story of Noah. The rain started to fall. The doors were shut to the ark. No one could get in because now it's not about following God, right? And I know that people think that was pretty cruel of God. The, the idea was it wasn't following God. It was just saving your skin. Right? Now, now I want to get on the boat. Because it's the only thing around here, you know, so everybody else is doing the how long can you tread water thing. <clears throat> right? And they suffered and died. And God did not rejoice in that. Okay? When you really study scripture, 
and you read and you read the story about crossing the Red Sea. And I have a book in my library that was written by a rabbi who who adds all this Jewish folklore into explaining the Old Testament to English people who have a crippled language to what the Hebrews actually meant. And he describes this scene that when the Red Sea closed on the Egyptian army and drowned them all, that the Israelites were rejoicing. And God reprimanded them and said, Why are you dancing when my children are dying? Sometimes it looks cruel, but don't kid yourself. God's heart broke when all those people had to drown. We are all children of God. We're all creation. Kind of like what Pierre was talking about. Find me a cup in the clay. And I'll believe in this evolution. Any, anybody, anybody who's studied any amount of medicine. Okay, right now, everybody's got colds. That's one little thing gone wrong in that mechanism of a body. One, one little thing. Most people get one little thing and undealt with what happens. The organism dies. Right? Heart defect. Kidney shut down. Appendicitis. I mean, there's so many ways for the human body to die and not work. So you cannot convince me that the first one that crawled out of the slime was perfect. And survived on its own long enough for another one to crawl out of the slime that's the opposite sex. <laughs> and then the two of them survived long enough to reach maturity so they can have sex to make the third one. Why didn't they just wait for another one to crawl out of the slime? <laughs> it just it just it just doesn't work in my head, people. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. <laughs> we know he's coming. We don't know when. So are we really ready? There is a song out there that I played for Brent. It's been it's it's a country western song. It's been it's been on the, the radio a long time now. But Brenda had never really listened to the word, so I told her I was just going to talk about it a little bit in my sermon, and so I put it on my tablet and stuck the earphones in her ears and said, listen to it. And it's Tim McGraw. And the song is Live Like You Were Dying. And, and the story is this guy's in his 40s, and he finds out he's got cancer, and he's dying. And so his buddy asked him, what have you been doing? And he said, I went skydiving. I went Rocky Mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. <laughs> and I spoke sweeter. And I loved deeper. And I gave forgiveness. I've been denying. And I hope that someday you get a chance to live like you were dying. I, I challenge all of you to get a book. And read it. Tuesdays with Maury. Yes. Get that book and sit down and read it. It is an amazing book. <coughs> the story is written by a young fella who, after graduating college, found out his favorite professor had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And the young student, or the young guy, is in Boston. It's been a few years after his college graduation. And Maury lives in New York. And so every Tuesday, he drives to New York to spend with Maury. And the very first day, he says to Maury, so what's it like? And Maury says, listen, I don't have time for BS. We're going to talk. We're going to talk about real stuff. It's not a Christian book. <coughs> Maury's a Jew. It's just the whole idea of, can you live like you were dying? Well, can we live like Jesus is coming back tomorrow? Have we been living like Jesus is coming back tomorrow? Because one day, God will be on our, our horizon, and time is up. Verse 43, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let the house be broken into. 
Now, this just makes sense, doesn't it? If you knew the house was going to be robbed, if you knew someone was coming to rob you, and you knew exactly what time and what day, you wouldn't be caught sleeping, right? Quite a few years ago, when Peter was fire chief, we found out that someone was going to light a certain building on fire. We knew who was lighting it, we knew what night they were lighting it, we knew how much they were getting paid to light it. And so we were sitting in the fire station waiting for the call, and so was Ormstown. And put it up pretty quick. If you knew when the thief was coming, you'd be standing in the door, right? <clears throat> Jesus is going to come someday. Be watching for him. Be packed and ready. Final verse says, Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, hell, thank you. And I want to live like he's coming back this afternoon. And I want to challenge you to do the same. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you. I thank you for coming to this world. We have just celebrated Christmas for you. I thank you as we sing that song that you, you wrapped our injured flesh around you. You breathed our air and walked our soul. I thank you for that. And I thank you for the promise that you will return and take us home. Help us to live in expectation of that. And rejoice. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.